and I will I want to give some brief information about her. Uh, she is uh, working as geologist at BP uh, until 2018, and also uh, she was in uh, exploration geoscience intern at BP. And re regarding to his educa her education, uh, she graduated from uh, Master of Science uh, Petroleum Geoscience at Royal Holloway, University of London. Also, uh, she had a Bachelor of Science in Petroleum Geoscience. Uh, and now I will give away to Dia Dana to start presentation. Dia Dana, you can start. And uh, regarding to uh, participant, if you have any question during session, you can unmute yourself and ask your question directly, or you can write in chat box and we'll read them through chat box. So you can start. Okay, uh, one minute. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Dina. As, and thank you very much for the introduction, Ramil. Uh, I'm a geologist from Trinidad and Tobago, as you mentioned, and I currently reside in Azerbaijan, but I'm on a career break at the moment. I'm pleased to have the opportunity today to present to you on the topic of seismic data acquisition. So thank you very much to the SEG student chapters of both schools for giving me this opportunity. As a geoscientist in the oil and gas industry, seismic data is one of the most important tools used to understand the subsurface and subsequently to inform key business decisions about hydrocarbon prospectivity, optimal reservoir management, well planning, amongst others. But seismic data is not only important to geoscientists, but to all subsurface professionals. It's used to derive information about the rock and fluid properties, to understand reservoir performance, which is also important for reservoir and petroleum engineers. So acquiring a seismic data set that is fit for purpose is critical for us to perform our jobs in the oil and gas industry. So on this slide, you can see a photo um, in the background and it shows an example of a marine seismic vessel. And this ship was the Kilabar seismic vessel used for the 2019 to 2020 treaty seismic acquisition program uh, by BP in the Azerbaijan sector of the Caspian Sea. So when I was putting together these slides, I just found this picture and I thought it was a great way to start and show an example of a seismic vessel. So the outline of this today's presentation is as follows. I'll first start with the objective of seismic acquisition, uh, then go through the principles of this process, uh, details of the acquisition process and design. Then I'll talk a little bit about marine acquisition versus land acquisition, the different types of surveys, and some of the key factors to consider when we are doing an acquisition program. And at the end, I'll have a little test. Okay, just joking. I won't have a test, but I'll just recap um, the key principles um, that I've covered today. Unless you want a test, <laughs> you can tell me. <laughs> okay, so the goal of uh, seismic data acquisition is to produce cross sections of the subsurface geology. So following uh, seismic data acquisition, the next step is the processing of the data and ultimately seismic interpretation. So the top of this picture shows an example of a seismic cross-section. And oftentimes, if you look at a geoscientist or seismic interpreters, a uh, computer or workstation, you'll see displays like this. And a lot of their time is spent around interpreting this data. They are required to perform seismic interpretation, uh, which is used to generate maps and geological cross-sections like the one below. Okay. 
So seismic acquisition is based on the theory of elasticity, elasticity, which means that the properties of the elastic properties of materials can be measured by their response to elastic disturbances or elastic waves. So once seismic waves are generated, they trans they travel into the earth and then they encounter geological boundaries. Once this occurs, reflections are emitted uh, back to the surface and detectors at the surface or re receivers convert these reflections into electric signals. Once we collect these signals, it's used to produce images of the subsurface. And this tells us or answers questions about what types of rocks are present and do they contain hydrocarbons? So on the right side of the slide, you can see a schematic of a 3D seismic survey. And it shows the seismic vessel, which carries the source and receivers. It then shows the green lines, which is, represents the ray pods traveling down to the earth and back up to the receivers. And the cube that you can see below is representative of the output 3D seismic volume, which is then interpreted by the geoscientist or the seismic interpreter. And it represents the geological layers in the Earth's crust. So the next slide talks about the acquisition process and the acquisition process contains, uh, consists essentially of three instrumental um, components. First is the source, which generates the seismic wave energy, uh, followed by the receivers, which detect the reflected seismic wave energy. And finally, the seismogram or trace, which displays the record. So you can see uh, below is a sketch, a simplified sketch of this process where you have at time zero, the source, which generates the impulse or the sound energy. This travels uh, and it's represented by the, the dashed line. The incident ray travels into the Earth's surface, into the Earth's um, crust. And once it hits a geological boundary between two different layers, reflected energy is travels back up to the surface. And this is recorded by the seismic receiver at time one. And if you were to look at this on the seismogram, it's represented by a pulse at T1. And that is the reflector. And it represents the acoustic impedance contrast. So acoustic impedance is the product of the density times and the velocity. And the amplitude of this reflected pulse depends on the velocities and the densities of the two layers. Okay, so next we'll talk about sources, seismic sources. And the purpose of this seismic source is to produce the acoustic energy. There are the different types of uh, sources. You have explosive sources, like dynamite, which is used on land, uh, non-explosive sources uh, used on land, vibrosized vibrator pl plates. And on the right-hand side of the slide at the top shows a vibrator truck um, operating on land as the source. In a marine setting, the sources are air guns, and include air guns and water guns. And at the bottom, Bottom right shows an example of this air gun array. Uh, so there are basic requirements of a seismic source. It must have sufficient energy across a broad frequency range. And this can be improved through arrays. It also must be concentrated in the wave energy that's required. That's your POS waves. We're most, mostly interested in those types of waves and reflection surveying and they must generate the minimum coherent noise. 
So coherent noise is the, any noise that's related to the ge geophysical survey, such as um, uh, the surface waves that may be generated by the source. And seismic source also needs to be repeatable, must be safe and efficient and environmentally acceptable. So oftentimes, well, actually every time, sorry, hearing a voice. Okay, um, before doing a uh, completing a seismic acquisition survey, an environmental clearance certificate is often required, uh, which shows that the survey will adhere to the legislative, legislative uh, requirements of that particular country. Okay, so next are the seismic receivers, and these measure the reflected or refracted acoustic energy. So there are two types of receivers, uh, depending on the setting. So geophones are used on land. An example of this is shown on the right. It's a picture of a geophone used in a land survey. And this, these geophones uh, uh, generate electric signals which are proportional to the particle velocity in the sound wave. Hydrophones are used in the marine settings and these respond to the pressure changes. Now there's a different type of sensor which is used on the ocean bottom and it contains both hydrophone and three geophones. Uh, these geophones are mutually perpendicular uh, geophones and this is often referred to as 4C or four component recording. So there are two main types of source receiver configurations. There's a split spread where you have receivers on either side of the central shot point. And this is common in the land surveys. There's also a single ended spread where you have a shot point, which is this point here, located at one end of the detector spread. And this is common in marine surveys, as you can imagine, a seismic vessel in front with the source being toward be behind it and then the streamers with all your um, receiver arrays. Okay, so just to summarize um, marine acquisition. So you have a vessel or you can have multiple vessels. Uh, in modern days, multiple vessels may be used to tow energy sources as well as the cables with the receivers. Multiple cables can be towed and also multi-source arrays can be deployed. And recently, the most popular source for offshore seismic acquisition are air gun arrays. Uh, we can look at the picture on the right hand side so you can see the seismic vessel and it's carrying the air gun, which is acting as a source. And then behind it are the hydrophones, which are along the streamer cables. So the source is deployed and it sends out the wave energy, which is not a straight line, but it is actually a wave front. And that wave energy travels through the different layers and as it intersects, uh, or as it hits the boundary between the different layers, the reflected energy travels back up to the hydrophones and is detected. So for ocean bottom acquisition, you can have cables or nodes, and this is important for retrieving the shear wave data. So if you did a conventional toad stream method, you would not be able to acquire the S wave data because S waves cannot um, transmit through liquids. So they're not captured. And S waves are particularly important to image gas in the subsurface. Another thing to note uh, with the ocean bottom cable method is that you don't have to, you don't require a vessel to transmit, to transport the receiver cables, 
because so therefore the shooting vessels can travel almost anywhere that they want. Okay. So the next slide, I will talk about an example from uh, the Columbus Basin, Trinidad, which is close to um, close to me because it's where I worked for ten years, and it actually shows the data set that I worked with for many years as well. And this data set called it's on the on the bottom right um, of the slide is an ISS. OBS example. So it was acquired with independent simultaneous sourcing technology using ocean bottom sensors. So in Trinidad, as you can see, um, so the first point of Trinidad is a small island, and offshore, the basin, the geological basin is called the Columbus Basin. And the yellow polygons show the survey area, so it's quite large. Then the red polygons show the gas fields. So in Trinidad, on the seismic section, you can see the brighter reflectors represent the gas reservoirs. And there are often multiple stacked reservoirs. So the, where you have the shallower reservoirs masking the imaging of the deeper ones. And therefore, the um, Vintage seismic data sets or the older data sets, which were acquired with two stream more, were not sufficient uh, later in the life, the field life development. High resolution was required to discover new prospects in the existing fields and also in future gas fields. So that is why the 3D OBS survey technique was, um, was employed. Uh, with the ISS technology. And some of the considerations to consider in, in Trinidad is that there was a short shooting season because of the weather, um, environmental concerns. It's also a, it was a large survey area and there's a lot of infrastructure due to platforms, um, drilling rigs, uh, well, well infrastructure. So to get the high density and the higher resolution data that was required um, for the purposes of the business at that time, within a reasonable time and cost, uh, BP at the time used this method, the ISS method of acquisition. Now, simultaneous uh, seismic acquisition is also known as blended acquisition. It does not require your sources to be fired alternately as is done in a conventional way. They can operate independently and at the same time, and the recording can be continuous. So it's a really efficient method for obtaining a really high density uh, seismic data set. So some of the factors to consider when recording marine seismic is the depth of towing streamers. So you want to tow your streamers uh, not at the sea surface exactly, but a little bit below so that it's, it uh, reduces the noise that's uh, due to the currents and the waves. And it also, this, so this depends on the resolution of the seismic data that you require. Also, the length of the streamer you need to consider. And usually the cable length should be at least as long as the depth to the main target. Also, the number of Hydrophone, hydrophone groups and the spacing between those detectors should be small so that the reflections from the same uh, reflector can be correlated reliably from trace to trace. So on the right hand side shows a schematic um, as an example, a basic example of a multi-source, multi-streamer um, marine setup design where you have uh, the seismic vessel here and two gun arrays, a blue and red, and then the dashed line shows the receiver arrays. So the gun arrays are spaced 50 meters apart, receiver arrays 100 meters apart. And as the boat sails in this direction, the blue and the red gun arrays fire alternately. And when this gun, the blue gun, uh, when the red gun fires, you get these four red lines, subsurface lines, 
and when the blue gun fires, um, the blue lines are recorded. So ultimately, you get eight subsurface lines per seal of the boat, 25 meters apart, with a gun rate with two gun arrays, 50 meters apart, and receiver arrays 100 meters apart. Uh, some of the other considerations include uh, the shooting direction to reduce non-productive time. So, of course, you want to have a survey that's as efficient as possible because the longer you take to shoot the survey, the more time, the more costly it will be. So that's why the shooting direction is important. And the dominant subsurface dip direction uh, we usually shoot in this direction because it produces a survey with the smallest distance between the recorded traces, which means that the horizontal resolution is going to be better. And you can see on um, below, there's a sketch of what uh, subsurface, and this is the, the brown layer represents geological layer. And this angle, it's dipping down in this direction. So that's called a dip direction. Uh, geoscientists will already know this um, and probably reservoir engineers, patrol engineers. And then your strike direction is di this direction. So another factor is the current strength and direction to avoid cable feathering. So cable feathering occurs when you have uh, planned survey lines like the blue dashed lines we can see here. Um, and then the actual cable location is um, deviated away from those survey lines because of the current acting in this direction and pushing the cables away. Um, so also to consider is the existing infrastructure. Uh, as I mentioned, things like platforms um, and drilling rigs in marine setting. So a technique to um, to overcome this challenge is called undershooting, where um, you have a source and receiver on either side of the particular feature, and it allows you to illuminate um, the, the reflectors below that particular obstacle. Okay. Um, so, sorry, uh, Yadana, yeah. there's a quick question. How marine acquisition process can affect the environment of the local? Oh, okay. So um, yes, particularly in the um, in the land setting, uh, landowners can be affected. So sometimes you may need to acquire seismic uh, data um, that passes through um, somebody's property. Also, in the seismic. Um, in the seismic um, setting, in the marine setting, sorry, um, there may be fishermen that may be impacted. So all those things need to be considered in the environmental clearance certificate that's required before uh, executing the survey. So um, fishermen will be will need to be notified, um, landowners will be need to need to be notified, and so on. I hope that answers. I mean, yeah. is it your answer? And also, uh, there's a one question from Ravi Shankar. How to okay. decide height of home spacing? Uh, okay, um, the hydrophone spacing, so it depends on the lateral resolution um, that's required by um, from the data set. So, the person who is de designing the acquisition survey would calculate, okay, uh, this is the lateral re resolution required of the data set. So we therefore back calculate, okay, how how closely the receivers need to be spaced in order to um, ac acquire that resolution. Any more questions? Uh, yes, there oh, is. Right. Okay. Uh, from Saram Aditya, 
uh, how can generate the sweep signal to do the convention? Uh, I think you mean uh, deconvolution. Uh, Aditya, could you sound your question if it is not a problem? Maybe it is deconvolution, yes. Maybe. Yes, I, I think so. So I think um, uh, that's specific to uh, land acquisition and um, it it is um, a processing step. So I don't think I'll, I can't um, answer that actually, but I can follow up on it if you, if you need. Okay. Okay. Okay, so I continue um, now. So the next slide, um, I, I took this from the PGS website because it um, really shows the parameters of offset and azimuth really well. Um, so offset is the spacing between your source and receiver. And azimuth is the angle between the source receiver line and the sail direction of the seismic vessel. And on this picture also, you can see a rose diagram, and you may be familiar with rose diagrams, um, which show the circular distribution of directional detail. So this, this photo actually shows a conventional standard industry um, design, which is narrow azimuth. And it shows basically on a rose diagram how um, at the center of the circle is representative of zero offset um, and outside of the circle is the maximal offset. So zero offset would be at this point, these, this area here, and maximum offset would be in this location here. So at the zero offset, what you can observe is that there's a larger range of azimuths uh, for the shorter offsets than you can see at the larger offsets. So that's a limitation of the narrow azimuth um, design for seismic surveys. Okay, so as, I'm, as I said, um, so in narrow azimuth, you can see this on a schematic again, uh, where you have your seismic vessel at the front, a uh, single vessel using being used to tow one or one or more um, seismic sorceries, and then you have your receiver spread around it, behind it. Sorry. Now, it may be beneficial to have more azimuths to improve the seismic imaging, uh, to improve the illumination of complex targets, and to also help removal of noise in the later seismic processing steps. So there are different types, ways of acquiring uh, multiple azimuths, more, more azimuths. So you can have multi-azimuths where you have several towed streamer surveys being collected over the same area where you have the seismic vessel traveling in different directions. So you can see this in this picture here. So it's, first it's going this direction uh, to the north, then to the northeast, then southeast. And you can see the comparison of the inequality of the data um, when you compare the single azimuth and the multi azimuth. So if you look at the picture on the left, it shows a really um, lower resolution picture. Um, you can see falls very clearly. Uh, there's a lot of noise as opposed to the image on the right where you can see the falls um, which are the breaks in the seismic data, very, very crisp and clean. Um, the amplitude response is a lot stronger and there's less background noise. So there's also something called the wide azimuth uh, to its streamer survey. And this is where you have uh, additional source boats at the side that are sailing alongside the main seismic vessel. So you can see this in picture one, two, 
and this helps to increase the separation between source and receiver and it's a technique for removing complex noise. Then you can ha also have full azimuth, which is a combination of your multi-azimuth and wide azimuth techniques to acquire um, a greater range of azimuths. So you could see this on a rose diagram. So in multi-azimuth, you just have uh, these. this range representative of the direction in which the boat would have traveled wide azimuth uh, you have a much wider range and then if you combine the two you have a lot greater um, range of azimuths and this is particularly important for uh, illuminating really challenging targets for example in gulf of mexico where you have salt diapers and also you can really attenuate a complex and coherent noise with this with this technique Oops. Okay, so now I'll move on to land acquisition. Um, so in land acquisition, it's different because you have land areas of um, lots more obstacles and you know, hazards to, to overcome. Uh, but it can be acquired in a range of settings. You can have, as you can see in the pictures here, you can acquire it from cities like in Paris, like here, uh, deserts, jungles, densely forested areas. And the preferred source in the land setting is the vibrator truck um, due to the increased efficiency of the source, um, little environmental impact, and the greater control that you can have over the source signature. But wherever you can't get a vibr vibrator truck to be accessed, for example, in dense areas, densely forested, forested areas, you may need to use um, dynamite, which is an explosive source. And with dynamite, you need to also um, dig shot holes to bury the dynamite um, so that you have greater coupling between the source and the subsurface so that um, the source is not fired into the shallow weathered layers, which would cause an excessive amount of noise in the data set. There's also variations in the, um, in the blast that occur, and this results in variations in the produced signal. Well, with fiber-sized trucks, it works by vibrating a heavy mass on a base plate. And this transfers the energy into the subsurface uh, through a controlled range of um, frequencies. And similarly, uh, like the marine setting where you can have an array of um, source, sources, uh, array of air guns, in the land setting, you can have a, an array of trucks as well to increase the force applied and enhance the signal to noise ratio. So this slide shows an example um, of land acquisition from my experience um, when I just joined BP as a graduate uh, geologist. Um, we had to go on various field trips to build our skills. And this one, this one is an example of um, one that we went on to, to build our skills in a 2D seismic acquisition. So it was an example of acquisition on land of 2D data in uh, central Trinidad, which was a forested area. The imaging depth was 20,000 feet and the fold was 60. Um, so the first step was the preparation and logistics. So we had you know, the teams or the companies had to acquire um, do data reconnaissance, uh, visit the area, observe everything around, um, obtain the envir environmental clearance certificate, uh, design the acquisition survey and the parameters of that survey, decide what technology needed to be used to encounter the specific subsurface um, um, problems uh, in, in that particular area. Um, also compensate the owners of uh, land and maybe people who live there as well. 
Um, things that contributed to noise in the data set would be cars, wind, rain, uh, barking dogs, all those things needed to be factored into the design of that city. There were also challenges uh, with coordinating with the police to, to escort explosives. So dynamite was used as a source in this particular case. Um, also variable topography, um, getting a reliable labor source and even sabotage of the seismic lines. So people would come across these lines and probably wonder what they are and maybe cut them and interfere with them. And that all those things impact um, the seismic survey. So I wanted to touch a bit on the different types of survey in terms of 2D, 3D versus 4D. So 2D surveys are usually acquired um, in the exploration phase for basin and prospect analysis. So if you just want a rough idea of what the subsurface looks like, um, you would acquire a 2D survey. And sometimes also it's um, used on land where wells are relatively cheap to drill and 3D seismic data is expensive to acquire. And with 2D surveys, the lines are acquired individually. So you don't have collective um, acquisition of, of your data. And it's there's a much greater spacing than in 3D. So sometimes around 200 meters between uh, the lines. And with the 3D survey, there's a much higher resolution that's produced. You get a much clearer subsurface picture and the lines can be even close, more closely spaced, uh, which helps with your horizontal resolution. 4D surveys are typically used in the development stage and it's basically a 3D seismic data set acquired at different times over the same exact area and the purpose is to evaluate the production changes on fluid and pressure and this picture here um, is from the Gulf Fox field in North Sea and what it shows is the comparison in the data set. So it's the same data set acquired at different times. First is in 1985. And you can see on the seismic, you see the yellow. Um, this bold yellow reflector represents the oil in the reservoir. And then you have your oil water contact um, here. Now, when you acquired the same over the same area in 1999, um, you can see a change in the seismic data where the yellow reflector, which represents the oil, is now here. Uh, and the, the contact, the oil water contact, is now higher up. And that represents the movement of the contact due to production. So there was a well at the crest of the structure and the contact moved up. So that's uh, 4D data is really exciting to evaluate and to really see the changes that may occur in production time in your reservoir. So now I'll move on to some of the main um, parameters or considerations that we need to think about when designing an uh, acquisition survey or program. So we need to decide what type of source and receiver we'll be using depending on the setting that we are in. Um, the spacing between the source and receiver, the offset, uh, the geometry of the survey. So we need to have the survey being big enough to cover the subsurface target. So it, it can't be exactly the same size as you can see in this picture because we need to factor in um, the migration aperture and the acquisition area. Um, then, then also you have um, to consider what is the record length or the sampling interval um, and then what noise mitigation techniques that we would be applying. So whether we using, we'll be using a source and receiver array to reduce noise in the NASA's surface and to maximize the acoustic energy being tra transmitted. So some of the um, important terms that you might hear would include a uh, signal to noise ratio. So I'm gonna mention this before and stacking is one of the 
methods that we use to improve uh, this ratio. Um, it's a process of adding together the traces from different records with the same common midpoints. So in the sketch on the, on the right, you can see the different sources at the surface and then the receivers. And for each source receiver um, setup, there's a common midpoint at this point here. So if you, this represents the different traces for those receivers. And once you correct it for the time, time difference, or which occurs in your processing phase, and then add those different traces together, you get a stacked or summed trace, which has a much better um, signal than the individual traces. And the number of traces that have been added together during stacking is called the fold. Okay, so the next slide, and that's another important consideration is the bandwidth frequency, bandwidth frequency and resolution. So if you have a broad seismic data bandwidth, it enhances the seismic resolution. Um, so seismic resolution is basically your ability to separate um, thin beds. So the higher your resolution, the thinner the beds that you'll be able to resolve in your seismic data. In the lower resolution, you cannot resolve those thin beds very well. And what we observe is that as seismic waves propagate throughout the Earth's crust, they are attenu attenuated and energy is absorbed. So this reduces the frequency of the signal. And what you can see here on this um, picture is that closer to the surface, the dominant frequency would be much higher. So at this depth, you can see it's 82 hertz, and then it, as you go deeper, it de decreases to 66 hertz, and then finally to, eight, to 42 hertz. And you can see that also on the amplitude spectrum, where you have uh, the loss of those high frequencies with depth. Okay. Um, so another important uh, consideration is something called aliasing. And this occurs when you have irregular sampling and acquisition or insufficient. So if you cost your sampling is too coarse, you can have aliasing effects. So you can see this on the picture on the right, where you can see um, flat reflectors, nice flat reflectors, but as you get closer to this edge here, you see the steeply dipping artifacts. Uh, so this does not represent anything geological in nature. It's, it's considered noise um, it, and it's due to aliasing where you have, um, it's not coarse enough sampling in this area. And we can avoid uh, aliasing by sampling in the data at least twice the highest frequency of the waveform or by filtering the frequencies above the Nyquist frequency. And the Nyquist frequency is the highest frequency that you can, can be defined by that particular sampling interval. So it's, there's a formula. So Nyquist frequency is half, half of the sampling frequency. Uh, yeah, Dana, there's a question in chat box. Oh, okay. Sorry, I haven't I been looking at the... Um, Yes, you can okay. have the slide, slides, definitely. Um, May I read if, them or I can read it at the end? You, uh, let's read it at the end. I'm almost, um, almost at the end. Okay. So we can do it, we can cover it um, at the end. Okay. So multiples. Um, so multiples is basically energy that has been reflected more than once. And you can see this in the schematic on your right. So you have uh, the primary reflection is what we are concerned with. But when that energy bounces a second time, it causes, it's basically a repetition. And we're not interested in that repetition. We're only interested in the primary arrival. 
You can also have near surface multiples and peg leg multiples. Um, so uh, I thought this was this is a really good example of a multiple. So if you look at the seismic data set, the strong reflector, yellow reflector, um, represents this re seabed reflection. Now, what you can observe um, just below it, below it, is this strange reflector that seems to cut across the geology. Now that is not anything geological. And it's kind of strange because it represents a seabed multiple, which is um, twice the two-way time. So if you notice, the seabed is at 200 millise milliseconds. And if you look at 400 milliseconds, um, you can see that multiple appearing. And if you look at the dip of that reflector, that multiple, it's twice the dip of the seabed reflection. Also, the polarity is re reversed. So whereas the seabed reflection is a positive, strong positive um, amplitude, red, it appears, the multiple is reversed, so a negative polarity, and it appears as a blue reflector. It also follows the same seabed topography, and, and as you can see, it's cutting across these uh, coherent um, reflectors. Okay, so acquisition footprint, um, and this is basically uh, grid pattern lines that you see on sometimes on 3D type, seismic time slices. You shouldn't see it because it should be um, eliminated in the processing stage. Um, but if you, it's important for the interpreter, seismic interpreter to notice whether these things occur and realize that it's because of the acquisition geometry and not due to the geology. So if you can see on this time slice from a 3D volume, these um, striations, type of striping across the data set. And that's not geological, it's a artifact from the acquisition. And it could be due to the acquisition geometry or due to signal processing prob problems. So source generated noise and incorrecting, incorrect processing can really accentuate uh, the acquisition footprint. So that's it for my slides. We've um, we've covered, um, I just summarized, we use seismic acquisition to produce images to understand the subsurface geology. It's based on the principle that the elastic rock properties can be measured uh, based on their response to the disturbance by an elastic wave. We talked about different types of sources, receivers, uh, what the traces look like, and the fact that you can acquire seismic data both on land and marine settings, and what are the main considerations for both environments. We also talked about some of the main factors to consider when planning and designing a seismic acquisition program to ensure that it's fit for the purpose that you want it for. And that's it. Um, so we can move on to the questions. Um, Thank you, Yadana. So yeah. uh, I've read the question part. So uh, from question from Emilia. I would like to know how much signal recorded at the hydrophone is accurate, or even which aspect affect accuracy of that signal. Ah, okay. Um, so there will be, um, I don't know the, the exact, it depends on the survey, but it's not entirely accurate. Um, the, the signal that's recorded will in, incorporate some noise. So noise can be due to, it can be random noise and coherent noise. So random noise would be, um, for example, in a land setting, you would have things like wind and noise, um, background noise due to people. Um, and marine setting, you would have noise due to um, the waves and the currents. 
and all those would be picked up in your signal. Um, well, for the marine marine setting, it's the hydrophone, yes. So it'd be a currents. Um, so all those would be picked up in a signal and they would have to be um, addressed in the processing stage, which is the next stage of, um, of the seismic, after seismic acquisition, the processing, and that you have to remove that noise um, so that you have the true signal that you're interested in for your seismic data. Okay. Uh, next question. Is... Next question. Uh, I think can we impose split configuration in marine survey from Aditya? Okay, so in terms of the spread configuration, we usually use the. We can't use the split spread. We would do the. Um, N spread, because. Um, it it would be uh, more costly and more time consuming to have um, the split spread set up in the, the marine setting. I hope that answers it. Yes. And next question is again from Emilia. In processing steps, we always begin applying a gain signal with depths. Are there any geophone technologies that are capable of getting a better signal response in depth to avoid the need of gain depth in forward processing? Yes. Oh, I really have no idea. Um, I am not sure. I'm not sure okay. about that. Sorry, it's uh, that's more related to processing, which is the next stage. And I can't say I'm too in touch with um, the latest technologies in terms of geophone to, to get that big, better signal uh, response. Okay, let's go to the next question. Mm -hmm. um, what is the difference between ghost and multiple? From uh, Okay. Um, I can't answer that off the top of my head, but I can look it up. <laughs> okay. And I think um, okay. So the ghost reflections are basically where it occurs on land, and it's where you have reflections back from uh, the ground or from the base of the um, weathered layer. And it's actually a type of multiple. So a ghost is also considered a multiple. So it is also noise and part of multiple? Yes, it's it's considered noise and it is a type of multiple. Okay. And uh, what are the common difficulties in survey? Okay, so the common, um, I touched on a lot of the different um, problems. Uh, so you have, um, for depending on the setting, the um, marine or land setting, you can have um, environmental concerns, you can have uh, the contributions to noise, um, you can have um, infrastructure concerns, whether they're drilling rigs, um, which would cause uh, so infrastructure that could cause gaps in the data and if, how you would overcome them by undershooting, for example. Uh, so whole host of problems that you can have and you need to consider in the design stage of um, acquisition. Next question. 
could you explain again why seabed multiple are generated at twice depths? Is it possible to get on the land data acquisition? Um, no, you wouldn't get a seabed multiple um, in the land acquisition. Um, so what happens is basically the seabed is a very reflective um, surface. So the energy, once it hits it, it tends to just bounce, bounce again uh, multiple times. Um, so you would see that it just bounces, hits it once, just like a ball. Like if you take a ball and you bounce it and hits it and then comes back up and then bounces again. So it just repeats the same reflector um, again, but it's the same travel time it takes. It's the same, it takes the same time um, to do that reflect, reflection, which is why you see it's at twice the um, time of the primary reflection. Uh, another question from Anas. Uh, thank you for this presentation. My question is, what are the optimum condition to get better resolution for a target about 18 meter in land and to resolve a layer with two meters thick? Thank you. For a target? Oh, oh I have absolutely no, <laughs> no idea. Um, I can't answer that question. I, um, um, I think that would require some some uh, maths with um, and some calculations, which <laughs> I really can't do right now. Um, sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, next question. Let me, let me look at. Okay, how can I identify multiple in low velocity layer zone? Um, which, sorry, sorry, can you repeat? Which one is that? Sorry. How, how can I identify the multiple in low velocity layer zone? Ah. Okay. So I think um, in the low velocity layer zone, um, if you notice a reflector that looks um, uh, sort of like a copy of a reflector shallower in the surface, um, and it follows the same uh, same dip, uh, it seems to cross cut cross cut across uh, reflectors, and it doesn't look uh, like it's geological in any in any way, then it can help you um, point towards the fact that it is a it, it is in fact a multiple. Okay, next. Uh, what are the fa some factors to consider when planning uh, and designing seismic acquisition? Okay, so I, I actually um, touched on um, a lot of those things. So we have, um, this is actually this slide here. Um, you need to consider your source and receiver type, spacing between the source and receiver geometry of the data set, um, your sampling interval, how long you want to to record for, and then the technologies that you want to employ, the noise mitigation techniques. Anything next? Uh, actually, no more question yet in chat box. Okay. And Gerdana, could you send the presentation to us? Yes, yes, of course I can. Okay. I can send I can send it to you. There's a few uh, questions related to that. So uh, participant will send the uh, video uh, recording version of this uh, webinar and as well as the presentation to your email. Okay. 
Okay, great. Um, so no more questions. I think no more questions in chat box. Let's wait two minutes. If there is no, we can write it up. Okay. But uh, in the intermediate, in the interim, um, thank you so much for your attention um, and for your um, questions. Uh, they were very uh, interesting. Some of a bit challenging. Sorry, I couldn't answer all of these uh, questions. Um, uh, I'll, if I can um, have them sent to me, I can I can try to answer the ones that I um, didn't cover. Um, but thank you so much for the opportunity and, um, and for listening so attentive, attentively, I, as I can see from all the questions. <laughs> thank you, dear Donna. Uh, I think there's a, one question from Yasin. He raised hand. Okay. Uh, Yasin, if you want, you can ask your question. I want uh, I want to say thank you for uh, the presentation. Uh, it's just a question about certifications. Uh, there will be some certifications about this. Uh, uh, related to that, or uh, not? Uh, there will be 70% uh, of this series if participant uh, will be, so they will get a certificate at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, and one more question, uh, Eduardo. Uh, uh, have you used a seismic instrument from Italian? Um, no, I have not. Uh, I have not used any um, seismic instruments from Italy. Italy. No, I'm sorry. Okay. So I think no more questions. There is in chat box. So I, I believe we can write it up. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Dana, for accepting our invitation for coming this uh, session. And we believe we will have more collaboration in future. And uh, thank you again for sharing your knowledge and experience with us, with students. And, uh, no and problem. And feel free to reach out to me um, anytime you want. And even to the students, if you require any um, coaching or mentorship, uh, you can access me on LinkedIn. I'll be happy to um, share my knowledge. Um, I have the time now, so. Okay, well, then uh, when we send the recording version, uh, I will send your LinkedIn profile to them. If they have any question, they yes, can, sure. I think. Okay. And uh, thank you all coming for this session. And uh, next time on search of Mars, we will have a next webinar of this year again event. Uh, it will be about on uh, rock physics and speaker will be Ramil Ahmadov. Uh, from USA. Actually, he's from Azerbaijan, but currently working and living in USA. And uh, he graduated from Wyoming University and as well as Stanford. And we will be glad to see all of you in that session. So see you guys. Take care. Have a nice day. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.